I'm officially recording. Do you consent to being recorded? Yes, sir. Okay. Isaiah, you consent to be recorded? Yo. All right, that's on film. <laughs> All right, what's up, guys? Today, wait, 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 wait. I got to start it. I got to start it. Oh. Three, two, one. <laughs> what's up, guys? Welcome to episode 25 of the THB Strength Podcast. Today, we have Sandre. Sandre, say your last name. I can't pronounce it. How do you say it? Gidormson. So, Sandre Gidormson. And then, what, did I get the podcast episode wrong? We have 26? Yeah. <laughs> All right, episode 26. <laughs> but I'm going to butcher his last name, so we're just going to say Sandre for short. Sandre, tell us uh, a little bit about where you're from, what you do. Uh, I will tell you he's a really good pole vaulter. I'll leave it at that, but then I'll just let him explain. So, what's your? What, for, I guess we'll start off with what's your PB? <clears throat> so, yeah, as, as you said, I'm a pole vaulter. My PR is 580, so that's 19 feet a quarter inch, I believe. And... Um, I represent UCLA. Uh, I'm in my second year there, and yeah, I compete for Norway internationally. Got it. And um, yeah. so, what, here's here's a good question. Actually, I was curious about this as well. What was your what was your progression like in pole vault? Like, how did you what, how did you even start pole vault? And then, what was your progression like going going along the way as you got better? So I started. I think I first time grabbed pole like when I was seven years old. Um. But it wasn't. It was just outside here and uh, on the track with my dad. We we had like two poles or something in in the the local uh, club's shed. Is your was your dad a pole vaulter? No, he 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 tried when he was little, but he was more a hurdler and on like national level. Okay, uh, so he was he always was like kind of pushing you guys towards track. Did you do a bunch of other sports or was track I did, like? I did like I did like five different sports. It was like gymnastics. I was a little bit into and then. Handball, I was I played till I was fifteen, I believe. European handball, though. The real oh, handball. Uh, what's the so handball? That's it's like a net, and you basically it's like running around. And you just it's like dodgeball into a net, basically, right? Kind of. There's a little more rules than that, but you play like handball, <laughs> baseball, uh, basketball court. Okay. Goalie has like his area, and there's like seven players on each team, and so on. But it's a pretty Is that, that like a pretty popular sport, and it's, like, it's like one of the most popular here. More more popular than cross country skiing? Uh, no, but it's, <laughs> the, the girls' national team—they're like multiple world champions. So, oh wow, so pretty big deal. What's the? Do you know what the population like? Like, what's your total population size is? Like, how many people? Five point two million, I think. Oh wow, that's so that's like the size the size of LA. So <laughs> that's crazy. <laughs> is that why you picked LA? Because it's similar size, very similar climate. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. <laughs> I think I think I picked it because it's a lot of the opposites. Yeah, it's exactly the opposite. <laughs> um, all right, so your dad was so he so he was he was mostly hurdler, uh, okay. and he's, he, I think he stopped doing track like when he was like twenty two or something, or twenty three, and then um, like do you know how talented he was? He was pretty good. I think he could have gotten better if he had my coach, which is my dad. <laughs> Bias answer. <laughs> <laughs> That's at least what he says. That's what he if says. If I had your coach, it being myself, I could That's, be a lot better. Well, to be fair, that's always what I say. Like everyone's like, "Why do you suck?" And I'm like, "Well, if I knew then what I <laughs> what I know now, I would have been a lot better." But whatever. Instead, I had like my gym teacher who was like 75, teach me how to high jump, and didn't like do the event and just like coach cross country. Like that was like <laughs> that was my coach growing up. So I definitely relate to him on that front. But yeah, you had your dad coach yeah, you. But I did, I did like I did like every single track event. It wasn't like much pole vault more than the other events. So I was like high jumping. I was throwing javelin. I was long jumping. I, I was very into hurdling because I had another hurdle coach as well. Um, I was part of like a hurdle group back then. And um, yeah, the SI, I was kind of short for my age when I was young. Uh, mm -hmm. I was very like developed early on. So as the other kids started growing more than me being more becoming more men i was i wasn't as good in like the more like physical sports like like hurdling or high jumping and stuff like that so but i was always really good at pole vault just because it was like so like technical yeah yeah and you were you faster than everyone else even though you were shorter I wasn't i wasn't very fast growing up until honestly like until the last two years i think <laughs> what do you what do you think you could run in 100 right now uh, I think my, my official PR is like 12.5, but I haven't run like three, four years or something. Yeah. But my, 
I I've seen you run down a hallway in an get airport. Down, get down to like 11 low, but I had I, to run multiple 100 meters to be able to like get the blocks right, be able to like be relaxed because I don't, I'm not used to running really fast without a pole or without hurdles in the way. So, so I saw you, uh, well, what's your hurdle time, I guess? It's on junior hurdles. It's uh, 1402. You I should, actually, uh, yeah. 14 you should, should be able to run like in the tens. I would think now I would assume like, what do you think you could do over the full size hurdles? Uh, maybe like a 14.3, 14.2. Last year I ran 14.6. On the okay. that was my that was my first ever hurdle race with a 42 inch. So <laughs> Isaiah, that's like I for, do it more in the future. Yeah, sure. Isaiah, for perspective, that would be like if one day you were like dunking on a 10 foot six rim, like and that was the norm. Like one day you got into college and all the rims were 10 six. I mean, I've tried I've tried hurdles before. Like <laughs> I, I, know, I know what that's like. They're, they're high. Yeah, yeah, like look, 42 inch. I remember like first standing by them. I was like, what the hell? Like, am I supposed to run full speed into this? <laughs> Isaiah, what's your, for perspective for the uh, listeners here, what's your, roughly, what's your 100 time? Uh, When we measured it last year, it was like, it was 12 flat. <laughs> so not very fast. <laughs> 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 to, to be fair, though, I will say this, like his, uh, Isaiah's start, like his first like 20 meters, he's basically like right with me, which we do. It kind of makes sense because in the training that I write, I don't know how much you know about like the training that I write for Isaiah, but it's very similar to what like high level track programs do. So we do a lot of accelerations. Like I'm sure you guys do at UCLA or with your dad. I don't, do you guys do a lot of Excel volume? Like well, a, lot of, a lot of like 30 meters and even with a um, sled, sled pulls. Yeah. So very, we do, we do a lot of that. I mean, we progress it obviously, but um, so Isaiah's start is like super fast. Like he gets into really good positions he has like good, like uh, his mo hits are mobile so he can like rotate his pelvis well and like he'll beat me through or he'll be with me through like 20. And then after that, it just like, it just is all 30, 30 meters. It's like after that is downhill. Every pro dunker just like max velocity is just not there. <laughs> so Especially like that was the first time I had run a hundred meter in like years. And I remember the last like, like 40 meters, it just felt like I was jogging like Cause like I I wasn't used to used to the distance and like having to go all out for that long, so it was yeah it was it was pretty bad. Do you do you guys do any like max velocity? Well, you obviously do max velocity work, but do you do like uh, extensive tempo or intensive tempo or like long intervals at like two hundred to three hundred earlier in the year? Or do you guys stay away from that completely? Me? Yes, you. Yeah, yeah, I I, I do I do a lot of running, but I think I think that's I don't know if that's too normal for pole vault like. I know that I always run a lot more than than other vaulters, um, especially especially American vaulters. I think because I've done so many track events that it's like I've gotten used to it, like for hurdles and for um, yeah, just track in general. Um, I do a lot of running, and especially in the fall, like I would do like just the other day. Now since there's no no Olympics, we can get more into that later. But I, it's more like like volume training. Um, so yeah like 10 times 200 like on 31 seconds so kind of slow just jogging it with like a minute or two break and yeah i do a lot of stuff on the treadmill when it's cold yeah i noticed that you run a lot on the treadmill so i think like personally i think the value in that is like you get a lot of like contacts and contacts it, whether yes. they're fast or like a little bit slower it's still a we contact. try making it we try making it like like really quick on the ground even though it's like slow pace mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, think, obviously, think, like 32 seconds for a 200 isn't isn't very fast, but you try to get the the contact times down. It's it's still good. Do you do you drop the times down in those 200s throughout the year? Like slightly, but not not much. Maybe I start around like 33 and then end up at like 31, 31 and a half. But it's it's not very fast. But it's like a, I mean, it's only one and a half minute recovery, so you definitely get tired. Yeah. How often will you do that, those types of workouts, like early in the year, probably like two, three times a week and then later like twice? Yeah, in the fall, it's like two to three times a week where I have like longer than like 100 meter of running, mm. um, kind of like aerobic running. And then uh, once you get into the season, it's it's down to like one or two, maybe maybe one time after a meet like uh, or the day after a meet, like as a recovery session, mm. but still, still keep that volume up through the through the season. Yeah, that makes sense. Have you ever thought about the decathlon? <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, yeah. That was, I think that was like my, my goal when I was like 
like younger when I did all these events because I was I was pretty technical in yeah honestly like all the events I've always been technical like I could throw the jaw I could learn the high jump and all that stuff but um as I just got much better in pole vault and started doing less of the other events it's more like you know I'm gonna go all in on in on pole vault but yeah I think I think the decathlon would be a lot of fun the decathlon I think I think you would you would kill the decathlon I think what's your best high jump it's it's not it's not great. It's like eighty five, isn't it? I haven't I haven't competed in a meet in like like ages. Yeah, I know, but haven't you jumped like pretty high relative to your age and height? Didn't you jump over your head already? Like yeah, but I I, I have jumped over my head, but then I wasn't very tall. Yeah, but still, I mean, how like, how old were you? I jumped like one seventy when I was like one sixty five or something like yeah, that. How old were you? You were like what, like fifteen or something like that? Something. Like that. Huh? Something like that. Yeah. So that's like. Now I would love to see you go out and just destroy two meters. <laughs> so, like, like what are uh, once my ankle and everything like that is is, is all good. I, I'm I'm sure I can go try it. I've like watched I've watched your technique. I've seen it, and I'm a, I'm a believer. I think you could easily go over two meters if you worked on it. <laughs> like I know I know a thing or two about high jump, and I'm a, I am a firm believer that you could probably do that. Um, what are what are some of your other now, this was something I was really curious about. What are some of your like PBs in the in the weight room or on the track? Um, whether it's like a fly ten or RSI, if you measure that, what's your best turtle hop height? All that stuff. During like sprint training, we do like thirty meter flyings, so thirty meter acceleration, and then we measure the last thirty meters. Mm -hmm. So there, I've gotten down to like three flat. I don't think I've I haven't gotten under three yet, but uh, but we also do them with a pole sometimes. I was gonna say, how fast is it with a pole? It's it's not it's not bad. I think it's like three 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 thirty five. Mm -hmm. um, so that that's not running like, with the pole for that long, like for thirty meters, you never do that in the in pole. Did you ever think about a ten meter fly with a pole? Do you know what your ten meter fly is with a pole? Like at? I haven't I haven't done it much, but okay. What do you think? Does Mondo hit in those? I don't know, but I know he's measured uh, during his last like they have like better measuring system when he's actually jumping, and he's gotten up to like ten meters per second at takeoff. And he's one of the guys that are able to keep, like, his maximum speed at takeoff. A lot of the guys have their maximum speed, like, a few meters before takeoff. Uh, yeah. But he's able to, like, maintain it through. And I think that's also one of my, even though I'm not, like, the fastest guy, I'm one of the fastest guy in the pole vault. Yes. Yeah, that's, that's, that's what I was going to say is, like, nine meters or ten meters per second without a pole, honestly, is not blazing fast. Like, I could... I don't think I could run that, but in my prime, I think I've gotten close to that. Like, I've definitely hit a fly 10 at, you right. know, whatever, like just a little under one second, like 98 or something like that, 0.98. Um, and then, like, you give me a little bit longer distance. That's actually one of my strengths. So, like, I would assume I probably would have ran, like, I don't know, 308 or something like that. Like, not, you know, not terribly fast, but, like, I mean, that's respectable. In track, if you're a D1 guy and the pole vault – or, like, in the pole vault, that would be pretty fast. Like, in any other event – even long jumpers can't maintain maximum speed through the takeoff just because it's, it's oh, so yeah. hard to actually take off like that. And with a pole, it's even harder. So to be able to to keep that maximum speed through takeoff is like one of the most important things. And I had like I think last year or two years ago, I measured in Germany and I was like nine five one at my maximum speed, which that's, is that's crazy. which is up there at like the best with like Mondo, Sam Kendricks, and and those guys who are the the faster guys and. So. That's faster than your. That's actually faster than what your off off the runway running with a pole probably was like in practice. Like you you vault faster than you run with a pole like off the runway. I think so. But that's it's, crazy. when you do competition, it's like a different. It's a whole different world. Like it's all the hype and like I I, I do a lot better in meets than in practice. But if we yeah. if we go back to like the 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 weightlifting PRs and stuff. Oh yeah, sorry. We we bounce all over the place. I'm glad I, you didn't I know, I know. It's all good. <laughs> <laughs> um yeah, recently since <laughs> since I haven't been able to pull vault um for a little bit, also coming back here. Um I've done a lot of cleans and snatches. Um and I think I hit one twenty kilos in the clean, hand clean. Hand clean. Is that power or pull? Power. Oh, so you've powered, you've hang powered 120, you said? So that'd be, Isaiah, I think this is going to be better than you. 265? Yes. Ooh, but Isaiah. Where I, you at, Isaiah? I never go past, like, I don't go till failure. So, like, if I make 120 and I see, like, it's kind of getting difficult, I stop there. And then 
I'll rather try next time when it feels easier when I gotten better. I don't. I try not to fail too much in the weight room. Okay, what's your height and weight right now? Uh, six one, one seventy five. Is that what it says on UCLA sheet, or is that what you tell your girlfriend, or is that actually what it is? <laughs> That's as close to what it is. Okay. It's like, it's like my my exact dimensions then. <laughs> like, <I'm laughs> oh. <laughs> exact dimensions as well. Yeah, yeah. Like exact. <laughs> That is crazy. Yeah, I've got I've gotten a little heavier lately just because um, more lifting and and stuff like that. I've gotten some more strength, but yeah. What uh, what's your power snatch right now? Snatch. I don't I don't do max there. I do like three three reps, and I did like eighty the other day. Oh, you hit eighty for three. Eighty kilos for three with straps. Oh, okay. Well, I mean that's like a European thing. You guys don't care about missing with straps. I don't know why. Like I always I, in the U.S. we don't do that. <laughs> like track, it's very common, but you will not see that in actual weightlifting. Like in the sport of weightlifting, yeah. I went to NMU, and there was actually a bunch of North Norwegian people there because there was a cross. The NMU has one of the best cross country skiing teams in the country, like their men's and women's team. Mm -hmm. So there were a bunch of Norwegians there. So I got to know about cross country skiing in Norway through them, and I was like, I don't even. This is like a world I've never heard about. Uh, and then like, I also was working with the Olympic training site at the time, but like people will like drop the bar behind them and get pinned. Like, I mean, it's different from powers, but I've never been ballsy enough to use straps. Like I just can't, I don't know. Clean I mean, snatches just, just, just snatches. What's that? Just on snatch or cause clean no, like RDLs and stuff. I'm just saying like on cleans and snatches, like some people on snatches will like some weightlifters will, but like, for example, I saw one of the guys that I used to work with, he was doing a full snatch though. It was this different. And he tried to miss behind him and he couldn't unwrap his hand. So the, the bar went like this and pinned him back down to the ground and put his nose and chest to the floor. And the bar had him pinned behind his, like the bar was on the floor behind him. So he's like in this weird dolphin cobra position with the bar pinned to the floor behind him. And I was like, I'll never use straps on snatch. I was like, I don't care. I'll chalk up. The, my grip strength is not a big factor. I can lift so much heavier with straps than without. So I feel like if I go without straps, I'm not going to gain as much strength as, as with straps. So you know, anytime I've, I've done snatches, like it's always been grip that has been like my limiting, my limiting factor. It right. feels like They're soft, <laughs> especially doing more reps. If you only do one rep from the floor, like you can re-grip every time. And yeah, before I used to do, I, I do the hook grip if I do without, but yeah. Yeah. I, I also use hook grip and stuff like that, but like, I don't usually do, like, I chalk up a shit ton if I'm going to do snatch, though. Like, I, I chalk up, like, the inside of my hand so that I can get a good hook, hook grip on it. Yeah. Uh, by the way, if you guys don't, a lot of our listeners, I don't know, they're, like, more into the, the dunking scene. They're less about training. But much of the training that we do, just for the listeners, so you guys know, is based around track. So a lot of the stuff that, like, Sandre and I are talking about is the reason we're, we understand this stuff is because this training has been around for a lot longer than what a lot of pro dunking or dunking has been doing but the prerequisites to jump high and pull ball high in terms of like what you're training for are kind of the same right you want high power output high elasticity yeah, you wanna, yeah like all those things are very similar so that's why we were able to have this conversation and isaiah also can chime in <laughs> but hook yeah. rip as you don't know is where you take the the bar is uh for the people listening the bar would go through your hand and then you'd wrap your thumb kind of like around and along the bar and then you wrap your index finger and your middle finger along the bar and it gives you a tighter grip and most people hate it at first because it's like smushing your thumb but then once you get used to it it's like the best thing ever it's like the bar moves so much faster i don't know i i love i love hook gripping I, it's weird for me not to hook grip actually on things like rdls and stuff i don't know if you have you found that to be the case i i it, for me just like when i i started doing it like two years ago and it hurt like a lot the first few times but now it's like just just a lot easier now but yeah. it almost I do now, it now yeah. if you don't do straps uh, good <laughs> i won't call you soft <laughs> good i say what do you like it better too you like hook grip yeah i love hook i've been doing hook grip since i was like 15 or something like that literally since i since i started lifting and like i just got i just got really used to it from a young age i think i'm honestly the only dunker that uses hook grip I think we should do a little comparison game, a little uh, dick measuring contest, if you will, about our weight room numbers for perspective, specifically with Isaiah and Sandre, so people can get perspective for track because they usually don't. So for the listeners, I would argue that Isaiah has one of the most robust training plans. When I, Actually, I will say this. He has the best training plan of any dunker. It's not even close. Track and field has been doing comparable training plans, high-level training plans for years. They're different events, but 
Um, Isaiah's training plan for bilateral jumping could work as well for a track and field guy. Um, so let's uh, let's see, Isaiah. What's your what's your best power clean from the floor? Uh, two forty five for two. Okay, so do you know pounds and kilos like pretty well? I, the conversion. I can do the math. I can do the let me calculate right here. So two forty five. That's a hundred eleven kilos. All right, so 111, what's yours from the floor? The floor. I haven't lifted I haven't lifted in a while from the floor, but I think I think I can do 115. 115? Okay. All right. And then uh they got the same dimension, same body weight, so most things are equal here. I think Isaiah's arms are a little longer, which might make it a little harder, but I don't you know, longer. <laughs> do you know do you know what your standing reach is? Like what you could touch? Is it over eight feet? I have no clue. But so it, that, I, I do not have the longest arms. <laughs> so that would probably favor you a little bit more in the weightlifting stuff, especially snatch. But what do you think your what do you think your best snap? You said eighty from a hang. Three from from a hang, but I, I think I don't think it's good. I'm equally good from the floor on 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 these. Okay. So you think you probably hit eighty from the floor? Yeah. Isaiah, what do you think you hit from the floor? <laughs> I don't even I'm bad at snatch. I think my best snatch was like 135, like just the plate. That's terrible. It's not even close. He mocks you. Well, mocks I have, you. I've never maxed it out, though. Like, that's like, like I was just like repping I'm it just out. Max snatch, and especially using, using uh, the grips. Yeah. So, I, so for, I'm actually the best at snatch relative to both of you guys. I, I've snatched 193. So, I've, I'm superior. No, I'm the better athlete. No, I'm playing. <laughs> but I actually, weirdly, like snatch is one of the lifts that like my hips are terrible like horrendous i have no internal rotation you'll never see me hurdle it's one of the biggest problems i have in high jump basically my entire athletic career has been unhinged by my stupid ass retroverted hips that are really shitty because i didn't know what i was doing as a kid didn't do any mobility and my parents had no clue so i never addressed it and then i heard it a bunch of discs and now they're really bad but for whatever reason in snatch i can get into a decent position i really turn out my feet and get like really narrow but i don't know why and i for a while, I was somewhat more mobile in my hips. Now I don't love it. Like I don't like being in that bottom position. It's just so tight and uncomfortable, and it really hurts my hips. Um, but yeah, I, I did end up getting eighty. What is that? Like eighty-eight? I almost hit ninety from the floor. So I was, it was a power. So I was pretty happy with that. But I can't uh, catch low. Like, you can't I, get to the floor. I can't. I don't catch them low. Like even on uh, cleans, like I just stand up straight. Are you, do you even do you even go down to like a quarter squat at least on the catch? Not really. Wow, that's crazy then. Well, so I, that's that's I different. Out a little bit when I catch, so they're not, they're not, in, I go a little bit out of my legs. Have you ever looked at your power outputs on those? Like your wattages that you produce, like with a accelerometer? We have one of these, but I haven't, I have not used these, no, so I'm not sure. But I'm curious. I, think, I think if I put it on, like it would say that my max should be higher than what it is, just because I'm not able to, because I can't front squat. What I, what I clean, I, I cannot front squat. Wait, what? Oh, yeah, this is a good one. What are your, what is your best deep squat, back, and front squat? Dude, like, like, one, 115 squat. <laughs> what? I can't squat. That's your back squat. Yeah. Isaiah, what do you think yours is? Mine, I just did the kilo conversion, 166. Yeah. All the <laughs> way down? Yeah. Oh, it's good, dude. You got to see his squat. He's long, he's real long. But his mobility is really good, like in his ankles. His ankle mobility is outside of when he's hurt his sprain his ankle. And like you, this is, I'm a testament to this. There's a, there is video evidence of this actually occurring. Um, no, he's asked to grasp. Like he has like a genuine weightlifter squat, like Olympic high bar. Squat. That's how I weightlift. That's how I uh, squat too. But I'm just I'm just not good at it. So yeah, that's that's kind of crazy. I thought you would have been a lot stronger. Um, that's like Stefan Holm. Didn't his wasn't his full squat like really trash, like really bad. I think, but I, I'm much, I know I'm much better at like the hex hex bar squat. Oh, like hex bar deadlift, you mean? Yeah, uh, yeah, squat. You deadlift. know, you hitting that. Well, I mean that makes sense because you're. Yeah, I do like four times on like one sixty. Four reps at one sixty. Yeah. Isaiah, what's your straight bar deadlift max? Do you know? Uh, four twenty five. Oh, this. So that- I was saying hex bar. I don't know about you. What's your? Well, yeah, but I'm saying just for he doesn't really do hex bar. I think Isaiah could hit over 500 in hex bar, honestly. Like for yeah. reps. I've done reps sure. on a on a hex bar. I've done reps with 405, like yeah, on it. That would be 185. So what's crazy is that like his 
uh, I would say in general, Isaiah's max strength is probably significantly higher than you when it comes to like most activities, like almost, almost everything. Probably, like probably I, I, I what I, your front squat is. Do you know what your front squat is? Front squat. No, that would be terrible. <laughs> But you're, but if you were to compare, to, so then if we were to say on the track though, do you know what like your standing broad jump is and standing triple in any of those? Uh, standing broad jump, I'm just like 305 range meters. So, so that's that, like, like, but is that over 10? That's like 10 feet, right? Um, it is, yeah, 10 feet, exactly. Look at me, man. I'm a wizard. <laughs> I haven't done standing triple, but I've done standing, like, three, like, double leg jumps. Yeah, you were doing those recently, weren't you? Yeah. I think that was over nine meters. Oops. I'm going to get cold. Yeah, I've done nine meters on 920 or something like that. But 920? Oh, so that's, that's, so this is a testament. Nine and a half, but... Okay, so this is kind of this is kind of interesting for for people that are that are listening. I think if you were to look at the trends of what you would see from someone, and, I, and Sandra, again, I don't know how much you know about Isaiah, but in dunking, he's I think he's the best in the world right now. You can make an argument for one or two, um, whether he's first or second, because he got hurt in Australia. But I think he was gonna I think he was gonna mop the floor with Jordan. No offense to Jordan, but he was ready to. Do you know who Jordan Kilgannon is? Are you familiar with him at all? He's like the guy with the, he had blue hair. He's a, he's a white guy from Canada. Crazy, crazy dunk. I think I've seen a, a dunking competition before, yeah. Yeah, he's a freak. But so they each have tested their verticals or whatever. And Isaiah's a, touched over 12 feet, which would be like in meters, uh, like Ilya Ivanuk. Like he touched 11.6 or something like that. And he's a world-class high jumper. Like yeah, you just Ilya. Have- um, the podcast. Like, eight, yeah, yeah. The guy we just had on. Ilya touched eleven eight. I'm sorry. So Isaiah's actually touched four inches high. It was eleven ten? Oh, it was eleven ten. Sorry. Yeah. I just down Ilya, if you're listening, I'm sorry. You're you have a higher vertical than I thought. I thought your arms were short. <laughs> but uh yeah, so sorry, he touched eleven ten and that put him at fifty inches, fifty inch vert. Isaiah's obviously a little longer, arms are a little longer, but for perspective, that's the second best high jumper in the world right now. Uh, and Isaiah has touched two inches higher than him and probably has another two to three in the tank. Like we can get more training in. So like he's very good. And this is bilateral jumping. So the contact times are like 350 milliseconds. What do you, what's your contact time in pole vault? Shouldn't tell you. I bet it would be like one, pro- probably like 120 or something like that. Maybe like high jump, high jumps, like 180 to 130. That's the ballpark. I bet pole vault's probably like similar to long jump, right? I want to get a mesh- measurement on that, but uh, yeah, I don't know. I think it's about 120, so it's about a third as long. So you're like three, you're three times faster than he is. So like on the ground, on and off the ground. Um, so if you compare a lot of the numbers, what you'll notice is this trend of like I say it's better. better in like like the more explosive lifts, like snatch and clean, versus like his is much better in squat. Exactly. Yeah, you're gonna see this trend of like once like because it's a specificity continuum you know what i mean like he's going to be better at the stuff that is going to have more specificity to what he's doing so really deep knee angle squats um very very high like force high force activity relatively slower is probably going to have a better transfer i would actually argue isaiah should be better at like full clean and full snatch but we don't really do it that often so and he's taller so that was like maybe another thing and it's highly technical but it would make sense that he would pull better from the floor than you would, than you would, and then you would do better in a hang than he would. Like you would favor those movements, you know what I mean? Because you're going to pick anything that's highly elastic because that's more, that's going to be more similar to track. You know what I mean? Do you yeah. do a fast counter movement when you do, when you do your snatches and cleans and stuff? If I do anything like in between sets? Yeah. Like, do you know, like, uh, do you like drop the shoulders down and then pull up fast? <sighs> like on your cleans or on your snatches? I mean, I, I guess. I, I'll, try, I'll try to pantomime it for you. So okay. do, you, do you lower, like, nice and slow and then pull up fast, or you, like, drop quick oh. and then pull up? Yeah, I lower, I lower kind of slow. It's not, like, a super fast thing. Okay, that's kind of yeah. interesting. Yeah, I, I lower slow and then I pull it fast up. Okay, yeah, typically if you lower slower, you don't have as much of a negative vertical velocity, so it's easier to accelerate the bar again. But if you're highly elastic, like if you've ever seen Yannick Claussen, if you've ever seen him, Denmark do stuff, Finish guy, yeah. um, he lowers super quick. Like he yeah, bounces the weight. Like, 
<laughs> yeah. And, but he's super, super elastic and his type two fibers are like, he's probably got more type two fibers than like anyone on the planet. I would argue he's insane. His, his hang clean is like three Oh three fifteen or something like that. And he's like, one, what's that? And he's so light. Yeah. He's like one fifty or one forty five. So that's like unheard of. Like that's like absolutely unheard of. Yeah. And I would argue, I talked to his coach Thomas and Thomas basically said like, he won't even, he won't even push like past that because well, one, there's really no point for him to do it. Um, and two, like his, his connective tissue, like he'll get hurt if he tries to push past that. He's that explosive. His muscles will like, it could rip the bone. It's more common for Yannick to like damage the bone than it is like for him to damage his muscles. Like that's how, that's how stiff his tendons are and how strong his muscles are. That the bone is weak, is weaker than the tendons. The bone rips off because he's so powerful. That's like, that's crazy. That's absolutely insane. Um, but speaking of injuries, I actually did have a bunch of questions for you. What were what were like two or three of the biggest injuries when they occurred? How they impacted your training? Like, talk a little bit about how you managed those and stuff like that. All right. Uh, my first like like bad injury was was like 15 or 16 years old, and I had a stress fracture in my lower back, like L5. Uh, very common for pole vaulters and gymnasts. I don't know about dunking. Mm, more it's, it's, it's extensions. I don't think you guys do that much in the extensions, but uh, a lot of extension and a lot of pressure on their back. And I was also growing a lot at the time, which was all bad for the lower back. And it eventually broke. Um, and it took like a long time for it to heal. And it kind of re-happened um, almost every year until it was like a chronic thing. Which Wait, you broke your back every year? Uh... We, we're not sure if it, like, recurred or if it was the same same fracture, but it was in the exact same spot, so it makes sense that it was just, like, gotten to a chronic fracture, but it, it's really small um, in the lower back, and you can be fine having a fr fractured back, like, your entire life. It'll just get stronger and, like, develop around it and stuff like that. Um, so that's, like, my number one injury, which I'll always kind of have to deal with, but now it's not, now it's not affecting me like it did before mm -hmm. uh, and then one recent injury which i guess is the second worst or maybe worse um is i had another stress fracture or stress reaction actually in my talus in my foot oh was that from the fall was that from when you fell no, it's, it's actually not from the fall it's just from repetitive jumping okay what happened with the fall didn't you miss the pit and like royally destroy your ankle like <laughs> obliterate it i actually no i i, I mean i i have fallen before uh but i've never gotten hurt doing it i've always been able to land i could have swore there was a video of you rolling around on the mat like in pain or on the ground or something because you missed the box or you landed in the in the like in the pool well, it's kind of old but i that didn't hurt me much it hurt my heel a little bit but then i was out for like a week and then i was fine uh, i was i was lucky i, I have know. so much i have so much respect for pole vaulters like it's it honestly seems like the scariest like sure What's that? You will definitely see some injuries. One, I don't know if you know Renault Lavalini's brother, Valentine. He kind of did the same thing as I did, but he landed on like concrete outside the pit with his feet first. And his like, heel just shattered and he had to have surgery. And it's incredible he was able to come back. Because, uh, yeah. Yeah, I think uh, the mindset of Cobalt is probably one of the most, like now that we've kind of covered a little bit of the, I was curious about those big questions. I didn't know what your training looked like, what numbers you tried to push up. I think they're pretty similar, actually. They're pretty comparable to what I would value for a pole water or for, uh, um, for any of my athletes. But um, the question that I, I wanted to know about is more your mindset. Like, how do, you, how do you just go look at a bar that's 20 feet in the air and just tell yourself, I'm going to run as fast as I can with this big-ass stick. I'm going to put it in the ground. I'm going to bend the shit out of it. It might break. And then I'm going to go upside down and twist and then start flipping over the bar and i might land on this metal box like there's yeah. no pit on the run on the runway you could land on the runway and honestly the higher, the higher you're gonna land on the runway <laughs> kind of the higher to jump the closer you get to the box because it's like the more up up you go and less less down the pit yeah doesn't, it, doesn't it feel like you're actually about to like i heard uh chad what? stormer told me this what's that well, who told you this chad stormer told me this he said uh and and um John Prater and Curtis Beach. I've heard this from uh, the the UK guy. Oh my gosh, I can't believe his name is slipping my mind right now. But they basically Steve Lewis. They were like, it feels like like when you're pole vaulting really high, 
This is a weird concept for people, but it feels like you flip so far, you're going back towards the runway. Yeah. Like, is that the sensation that you have? Yeah, definitely. You, you, you go like <laughs> totally vertical and you're vertical before you're like, you're still above the track. Like if you take a picture of you, you're totally vertical before you're like into the pit. You don't really go into the pit before you start turning and going over the bar, which, uh, which, yeah. So how do you, I'm, I'm curious, this is, this is going to be like going along with your question, John. I was talking to John the other day about, there's a saying like, like in the dunk world, it's like dunk or die. And like, when yeah. it's kind of a mentality when you're doing a scary dunk, like there's some dunks, some people jump over cars. Some, sometimes there's two people standing on top of each other, like you're going over them. And you kind of have to go into this place in your mind where you like don't think about the risks at all. And it's just like, I'm going to put <laughs> everything into it, into the jump and what happens and not care about like the consequences. And it's like, it's, it's that dunk or die mentality. It's, Would it's, you say it's something similar in pole vault? Like with, sure, with, with sure. your mind approaching the bar and all that? Definitely. And uh, the higher you go, the more of that mindset you got to have. Uh, in training, it's a little like I guess the same for you guys. Don't do this like crazy dangerous stuff. And um, so yeah, training is not as it's not as bad. But in competition, you really gotta gotta have that mindset where it's yeah, dunk or die, jump or die. And um, when you go really high, you're pushing really big poles, and the risk of of being flinged back on the runway is much hard, much higher than in a training training vault. But yeah, for my for my PR, which I think you know a little bit about, John. Like I had a stance on forty centimeters. Oh yeah, okay, yeah. So for those of you that don't know, maybe talk about talk about the stands and how that. How yeah, that so like in pole, that. you can change where you want to have the bar, like compared to where you put your pole. So you can have it between zero and eighty, and obviously, if you have it at zero, you're gonna, yeah, pretty much land in the box. So most people have it at between sixty and eighty, but the higher you jump and the stiffer pole you have the closer you want to have the, um, the bar because you're not going to penetrate the pole as much. Yes, it's for those of you that don't know, pole vault terms, penetration means how, that means making it into the pit. So like yeah. you can have, if you were to think about uh, like a parabola, um, you can have one like early on in pole vault, a lot of people have a really low arching parabola. And the same thing kind of happens in long jump or whatever else, right? And then the better you get, the narrower that, that parabola comes, the higher the apex is. So more of your energy is spent going vertically and less of it is spent going into the pit. So if you're a better pole vaulter, generally speaking, you want the, <laughs> not that you want, but you will see the standards, like you said, will move, the pole will move closer to, the, to where you plant the pole um, and you're, you're, you're trying to go more vertically. But that's scary as hell because the, there's a metal box underneath you that you could land in. <laughs> so so at that, at that, PR jump, like I was, I was so close to the pit, but yeah, obviously I didn't land there and didn't get hurt. But yeah, you, it's um, uh, you, you can't, you got to be a little crazy to be a competitive pole vaulter for sure. And um, because a lot of things can happen, like as you said, like you can break the pole, you can land outside of the pit, uh, and so on. And the better you get, you gotta be able to get on a stiff pole, and that can be scary for a lot of people. What, what do you think is one of the biggest barriers for people vaulting? What would you say like five, like I'd say like five meters is a big mark for a lot of people. And then it seems like it's like, like if you can get past five meters, you'll kind of like get past your fear to get to like, depending on the person, like 525 or 530 or something. And then there's like, you know, maybe 550 and there's another level. Like if you're at 550, you're, you're good as shit. Like you're on, like at, at Duke, for example, if you jump 520 or something like that, like you'll probably score points at ACCs, right? Yeah. And then like, you and then like you know now what do you what do you have to jump to go to NCAA's 550 something 560 uh, for indoors where they have 16 people like just 16 best in the country it's like 550 most of the time between 540 and 550 and that's like for perspective that's like good as shit like like most high school kids most people will never vault 5 meters in their life like yeah. like pole vaulters that go to college will not vault 5 meters in their life they vault 5 meters and it's like damn anything extra is just like yeah. that's you know that's incredible then you get to 520 and you're like Ah, like I'm, I'm really good. And you're like, maybe I'll try to like get to 535. You're just trying to like crawl up. Then you have people that get to 550. And these guys are like, they're like, these are the guys that are like, I'm going to the Olympics someday. Like I am good. I'm one of the best in the country. That's, that's the mindset, yeah, for sure. And then, and then the next level is like anything past that. And you're like, I'm going to be world champion. And that's where Sandre's like mindset is that you guys viewers probably don't understand. 
<laughs> so you, so like, how did you, what do you think is the separator when you get past those marks? Like as you move through those marks, like how does your mindset change? How do you, how do you handle that? Um, why do you think people can't? Like, do you think it's that they're afraid to get on big poles? Like what do you, what, what is the, what's the barrier? I think a lot of it comes down to like, just being an athlete. I think you can jump like, like five meters for sure. Um, and even up to like 530, 540 maybe, um, without being the greatest like athlete in general, like you can be a little heavier, you don't need to be as fast if you have really good technique and, and, and these things. But if you want to go past like 550 or even even like 580 and, and more, you got to be like a well-rounded athlete and you got to be really fast, which a lot of people like. You got to have like really good like form. Just like running form, um, and just things like like decent college vaulters don't necessarily have. They're lacking in one of these things. But to, to really be up there, you gotta have all the all the factors. You can't you can't lack one thing or the other. Because because like I feel like in the states, I, honestly, I, I think there's a lot of pole vaulters that jump five thirty or even five meters that are faster than you. Probably yeah. like honestly, they I, they're faster maybe, for a thirty. I I think they could beat me like in a straight up hundred meters, but no way they will beat me running down a runway with a bar up. <laughs> with a bar up. So I think yeah. that's that's the difference between um, being like a decent pole vaulter and, and and being world class. Yeah, I I feel like it's this like central governor thing. Like you just don't like your brain doesn't you know like on a car there's a governor it says don't go this fast right like like two two ten that's the top out we don't go past that like <laughs> miles per hour you know and then it's like. For you, you're like, yeah, I'm just going to remove that completely and I'm going to run faster. <laughs> like, I'm going to bend the shit out of the bowl. Um, so, like, I, I definitely, that's what I've noticed is, I've heard people say this before, but it's like the best pole vaulters are just fearless. Like, they don't care. Like, and long, great like, athletes, like, just, just all over athletes, like, general athletes. Like, like, a lot of people that I know that jump, like, 530 and stuff like that, they, they're not flexible. They can't. They can't do like hurdle drills and their coordination isn't really good. They have no chance doing any gymnastics. But um, so if you want to really be better than better than that, I think I think you got to have like more of a com complete package and you can't can't lack these things. Yeah. Yeah. I definitely generally agree with that. I think it's like you want to leave no stones unturned. And that's like often what I say in my training is like we leave no stones unturned. I want you to be. Well, like the mobility thing is, I think is very specific, like pole vault and track in general, you need a lot of mobility. <laughs> like you gotta, you've got to be able to rotate your hip, your pelvis. You got to have other than the ankles. I don't think like your shoulders have to be crazy flexible, your spine, your, your T spine, your scap, like being able to get into those extension positions with, with the pole above your head. Like you have to have super mobile shoulders, super mobile hips in pole vault generally. Right. Especially when you, if you do you tuck or what is your. Are you, do you do like, what model do you I, I would talk when I go upside down, yeah. I start start having a pretty straight left leg and then eventually when I go upside down, I, I tuck a little bit, yeah. But, okay, so yeah, generally like you just have to be pretty mobile to get into those positions in bolt. I would, I would pretty confidently say that. Dunking, it's like you want your ankles super flexible, which is probably very different. Um, you probably, you need a lot more like, whereas you wouldn't necessarily want to have a lot of like backside mechanics. In jumping events, when you're pushing into the plant, um, like like vertical jumps specifically at pole vault, you see it, but it kind of just happens naturally because of the way that you're taking off. Um, you want to be able to have a really flexible hip, almost like hyperextension, basically. And actually, I'd say pole vault at takeoff, you guys get into like hyperextension at your hip and your low back, don't you? Like you really get into that C, the C position, you know what I'm talking about? The, the reverse C, I guess it is. Yeah, reverse C. Yeah, that, that's, that one you got to... You gotta be able to do for sure. Yeah, and it's, it's gotta it's, be strong. You also gotta be very strong in that position. Like you yes. can't be able to do the do the movement. You also gotta be very strong in that position. And yeah, and that's definitely very hard. I, I I definitely could understand that. So yeah, I think the the physical capabilities to like what you're trying to push forward at any any track and field event, but pole vault is particularly interesting because you're you have a pole in your hand and you're, it's above your head and you gotta run into your shoulders. Uh, what is, um, oh, you gotta be, what I was really saying is you gotta be strong at a lot of things. You gotta be good at a lot of things to be a good pole vaulter, which is why I think pole vaulters that are tall, well, first off, they're usually better pole vaulters when they're taller and faster, but you do see a lot of short guys do it. 
but I think they have a, a lot of upside. They could do the deck if they wanted to. I that's why I'm like, you know, they're kind of comparable. And once you get past that 550 mark, you're really good pull order. It's like you probably could do the deck if you have any level of ability. Like sometimes pull orders can't jump weirdly. Like, can you dunk? Do you know if you can dunk a basketball? Uh, I don't think I can dunk a basketball. I think I can barely jump. Dunk, uh, I, I'm honest. I'm honest. I think I can. That's dunk, crazy. I don't. I don't think I could get both hands that high. But like, if I if you take me long jumping, I can easily jump twenty three feet. So you jump twenty three feet running uh, three seconds in a thirty meter fly. Yeah, that's pretty wild. That's wild. That's that's really far for like. So you've got to be super strong at the plant. Do you? Would you say that you have one of the most aggressive plants, like like penultimate plants? Yeah, like if if just like the, the compliments I've gotten like on my jumps, like ever since I was young is that i've had a good plant and take what does that mean you know that's just that like a lot of people are like kind of like going into it not like a little bit scared and not fully like giving it their all um while i've always just like really run through it and been able to carry my speed through the takeoff um so i think but like i think one of the the main reasons for why i've i've gotten to this level um of pole vaulting is just that I've been like so well rounded, and that I haven't just I haven't just done pole vault my entire life. Like running hurdles, like until even last year, I I raced in hurdles. I think that's helped me a lot in um, in the pole vault. And if you see like even even though Sam Kendricks didn't really do other track events, I see him. He can he trains the hurdles, and Renault Lavalini even competes in the hurdles, and he did the deck like multiple times. And yeah, you got you got to be like well rounded. Yeah, for sure. Um, what is the, uh, this is a big question for pull waters, top arm, bottom arm coming into the plant, press, pull, press, pull, pull, press. What do you, what, like, what are you feeling? What are you thinking? What's, what's your well, opinion on this? Well, me and my dad have been having a discussion lately on that. Just like, uh, I saw your face, you lit up. You were like, oh, I don't want to talk about this. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, no. We, it's like, I don't even know if me and my, my, my dad and my coach agrees on this, but there's definitely no pull like whatsoever. It's all it's all push, but it's it's more like a question of how elastic your arms are gonna be. Uh, like your right arm tends to be straight all the time, so that's like a no brainer. And then your left arm, there's a question if you want to have it like like bent like this going over the head, or if you want it more straight going over the head like this. And then there's also a question of how much you want it to go back. Yes. Behind your shoulders, if you wanted to go just go back a lot. Or if you just wanted to go back a little bit and be more stiff, and I believe, um, I believe that it'd be better to be a little bit more stiff at takeoff with both arms and not let your arms go very far behind your head, your uh, your head. And that, so, so you, when you hit the box, like you're running full speed, right. it just feels like you're literally just taking like a bench press action, basically, like you're just pressing as hard as you like as hard as you can forward and upwards or what is that what is that what's your arm action doing like is it more your momentum that is carrying you and you're just putting your hands out or is it that you're jumping and pressing into it it feels like pushing your hands high upwards at the same time as you're trying to do like a pullover a pullover oh like like this action yes oh okay okay yeah so it's like a like a med button back it feels so it feels like you're like that then, okay so chad stormer he literally said this is what he told me he said put your hands above your head because i asked him i said what's it feel like i gotta turn my camera up for this but he said pull all feels like this he said you put your hands above your head imagine i push down on your hands and it pulls you back and then you push away as hard as you can he's like that's what it feels like and he's like most people like they don't they don't understand that that almost like a whip action that happens like it's gonna hit you you're gonna hit it and then you want to push back like you whip it back the other direction when you it starts to go start, under it. You want to start that action like right as you hit the takeoff. You want to start your arms going like because if you if you like are relaxed when the pole hit the box, if you're relaxed then like you're gonna end up on the runway. Like you gotta hit you gotta be strong there and you can't let it. You gotta control the pole. Wow. That's, and, and what's crazy, a lot of people also don't realize this, this, this tweaked me out whenever I was screwing around with pole vault like a couple of years back, but when you take off, like in long jump, the, the board's whatever, 10, 16 feet away, whatever, from the, from the edge of the sand and you yeah. jump, you go as far as you can. In pole vault, the longer the pole is, the farther you are away from the, pole, from the bar. 
So yeah. when you take off, imagine there's a 20 foot bar ahead of you for, for listeners. You are also 20 feet away from the bar. So it's all, it's 20 feet vertically and 20 feet distance wise away from you. <laughs> so like not 20, it, I don't know what the pole, I'm just saying I, like, my take, off, my take off point, like measured from where you put the pole, like the box is yeah. usually like around 14, six. Okay. So let's say 15 feet. I was just being yeah. dramatic, and but that's, it's 15 feet away. Yeah. Is, is that close or far for most people? Very far. Okay, so fifteen feet away. One of the far, like one of the farthest. I think Mondo is like like thirteen, three, four, or something like that. What's like what's the foul line? I think. What, or sorry, what's the foul line to the edge of the rim? Does anyone know? Fifteen feet. Yeah. Okay, so imagine this, guys. There, you have to. The the rim is fifteen feet in front of you. You got to jump <laughs> the foul line with a pole in your hand, and I'm telling you to jump over the backboard, <laughs> like, and that's a load. That's a load jump. That thirteen feet. That's low. You you're trash. Okay, add another seven feet to that, and then you got to run from the other side for basketball player for perspective. You got to run from the other side of the court, full speed with a pole in your hand. You got to take off from the foul line. Okay, you got to, and you have to be confident that you're going to vault over seven feet over the top of the backboard. That's like unheard of to me. <laughs> like, and then you're telling me don't be soft. You got to attack the shit out of the pole. Like, that's just a mind blowing mindset to have for a lot of people. I feel like. Um, so yeah. So what's your opinion though on the on the soft? You want to? You're saying totally stiff. Push back. Don't let any give in your hands. I mean, I don't do that right now. Like, but that doesn't mean that I'm not for it. Like, I, my arms kind of go back like this, and I try to push away really quick. But I would want my arms not to go as far back and to be more rigid in both arms, honestly. But I don't like like some people do like a block where they just have their left arm in front of them just blocking it. I don't like that. I think you need some of this. Uh, Elastic, elasticity. What am I saying? There you go. Elasticity. Elasticity. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Elasticity. Anyways, it's. Yeah, I agree. It has to come. I think, physiologically speaking, the shoulders are not tendinous. So, it, like they are, but not like the patella tendon or not like the Achilles tendon, right? Like those are very stiff band-like fibers uh, or like yeah. fibrous connective tissue. Your shoulders are ball and socket joint, like your femur. So it's not like your femur is not an elastic joint. It's, it sits in the socket and it, it goes like this, right? So it's not like a tendinous, like your knee, your knee, you hit, uh, you, your femur wants to go forward. Your knee wants to bend. You want to stretch it and then it pulls back, right? It's a, it's a hinge joint. It's very, very different. Um, where your shoulder is ball and socket joint. So you can have, I mean, there's a bunch of tendons and, and ligaments that connect the shoulder, uh, the bone and the muscles to the scapula and your, and your clavicle and your, and your ribs and stuff like that. But generally speaking, it's a much harder to get an elastic response out of a ball and socket joint, just like physiologically speaking. Does that mean it's not possible? No, because you can still have a level of elasticity in those shoulder, shoulder joint, you know, in the shoulder joint. But I think, um, speak like internally, that's what happens. But externally, if you're looking at your shoulders, and you're looking at the pole, if you have a softer shoulder, right, you have a sh softer axis here, a softer action here, and you have a pole that is very stiff, and you've got a lot of give here and not a lot of give at the pole, uh, you're going to lose energy in the pole, right? And the goal of pole vault is to put your energy from the run into the pole so that you, once you leave the ground, you have enough energy to penetrate forwards and upwards. So I would generally speaking, I mean, this is physiological because there's also a level of rate of force development in your shoulder. When you hit the box, this is why gymnasts I think are so good. Are you able to stop, stop that backwards force and push forward again super fast, right? Because some people might have more give and they and they might push back a, a bigger dif distance or whatever. But if they can do it faster, they might actually get more impulse out of the out of the jump. So it is, in my opinion, super independent to the person, right? Like some people are going to be better where you have 130 milliseconds to produce force like this. Um, some people are going to be better like that. You know, it's like, kind of depends on the, on the person. And I think like you probably have to, there's probably a bandwidth of what's acceptable, right? There's a certain amount where it's just not going to work. And there's a certain amount where like give, you know what I mean? Um, and you yeah. people jump high both ways. Who jumps the highest, which way though? Right, right, right now, Mondo's the world record holder and he has a pretty stiff arms, but then the previous world record holder or the previous previous one, which was Bubka, which I'm just as high almost, he had much softer hands and yeah. he had more time here. But so Yeah, so I think I think it's like again one of those things you'd have to look at the other metrics. Like typically when you look at something like that, 
this is my opinion, but I found this to be true in every single event. When you, people think that like dog, they think dogmatically. They're like, oh, if you get this, it's better, automatically better. And generally speaking, I think if that's your mindset, it's probably wrong other than maybe a hundred meter dash where faster is better. Uh, you know, those things are true. You can be absolutist in those senses. But when you're looking at internally without looking at the external values, right, of kinematics, when you ignore the kinematics and you just say, this is better, I think you have to be very, very careful because generally speaking, the, everyone's physiology is different. Everyone's physiology probably is predisposed to perform better a certain way versus maybe someone else. So when you gain, but if you're looking at the overall outcome measure, then you can look and say, okay, yeah, one of them is stiff in the arms, one of them soft. Were they both fast? Hell yeah. Did they both have a high plant? Yeah, for sure. Right. Did they both, did they both lose velocity or did they both have a minimal velocity loss at takeoff? Yes. Both of them had a minimal velocity loss at takeoff. Do both of them have a long swing where they, you know, when they get to that point where the ground, the pull reaction force is in line with their body, they've got a shit ton of angular momentum. Yes. Like those things are true. You know what I mean? And then how you get there, the nitty gritty, it, again, it's typically gain and loss. Like the Bupka had a long swing. Did, does Mondo tuck? Yeah. So Mondo tucks, Bupka does not tuck, right? Like, he does a long swing the whole way through. Generally speaking, if you have a long swing, you're ang you need more angular momentum to rotate up vertically on the pole because your body's longer. If you tuck into a little ball, then you'll spin faster to the top of the pole, correct? Who uses who uses a bigger pole, Mondo or, or Bupka? Uh, I don't know if you take it relatively to body weight, but Bupka is known for having an extremely big pole. Okay, so... It would seem as though, I would argue, that Bubka probably had more angular momentum. For him to be able to swing all the way up like that with his body that long, yeah. he had to have more angular momentum. He had to have more energy in the jump somehow, somewhere. Mm -hmm. Mondo had to tuck, which helped him rotate to the top of the pole faster. And again, this is a question I have. If you get to the pole faster, generally speaking, like a lot of people have this problem where they don't get to the pole, they don't time up the pole pushing off and then pushing off, right? So they're basically late on that swing. They don't have enough angular speed to rotate them to the top of the pole. Is that generally true? Is that generally a true assumption? To not be able to get a vertical? They don't, they don't, like the pole is not pushing off as they are pushing off. They're not vertical on top of the pole as it's releasing its energy vertically. Do you see yeah. what I'm saying? A lot of people like can't get upside down before the pole starts or it can be coiling and then you're not going to be able to have that like maximum push. You want to be, you want to be completely upside down when the pole is still bent. Exactly. Does that also, do you believe that also keeps the faster you swing, obviously you're on top of the pole, but do you think that the swinging action and being vertical on the pole, does that help it stay loaded longer as well? Or do you think that it's totally unrelated and that more has to do with the energy of the jump prior to takeoff or like at takeoff? I'm not sure, but I do think like by swinging, you're putting more energy into the pole just by, because you're having a longer lever lever and then compressing yeah. the pole more. So I think, I think the swing, the, the faster you swing is a result of the pole reaction force pushing through your hands relative to your center of mass, right? So yeah. if you had like, um, you guys can't, if you're listening to this, you can't see this, but I'm holding my phone. If I hit the, uh, my phone's vertical. If I hit the top of my phone, the bottom of it rotates forwards, right? So if I hit it with more energy higher up, what's going to happen to the, what's going to happen to my phone? It's going to swing faster. The bottom of the pole is going to, or the bottom of my phone is going to swing faster, correct? You would agree that's basic physics. So if you have a faster, a faster run with a higher plant, right, you're going to rotate. You're going to have more inertia to rotate faster, right? Um, because that's just like if the, the moment's bigger, the center of mass is going to rotate quicker. Um, you're going to have more angular momentum. So I don't know. I haven't really looked at the physics to really break it down and say who had a higher plant then as well. Did, did Bupka have a higher plant? Uh, they're, they're, they're pretty – they're like both six feet, and I think Mondo has longer arms than – Hmm. interesting stuff when you get into the nitty-gritty of it but yeah, yeah I, it's a I very think that's, complicated event what's that it's a very complicated event and no one really knows still don't know what is the, the very best way to jump or even if there is one more best way to jump yeah for sure i definitely i definitely am noticing that more and more which makes learning the event super difficult so yeah. we have like one more we'll ask one more question we'll ask it about the olympics i want your opinions on the olympics and then what your goals are what you're shooting for in the future uh well I think it was it was a good good decision to push it backwards and now it's been like a couple of weeks since they did it and you see that it's, it's not any much better right now so I think is it's the best option much better than being canceled yeah so 
will be just as good as it would have been this summer. Um, yeah, and I'm very excited for it. And now I get one more year to train for it. I'm not too sad about that. Um, so yeah, I'm I'm very excited going into next year. I guess we will still don't know if there'll be competitions in this summer, but for sure next year the Olympics in Tokyo will be will be great, and I think I'll be ready for it. Okay. What are you? What are, what's your goal? What are you shooting for? Um. This summer, my goal was to get to the final, and I think that goal still stands for next year. But I'll have an, a whole more another year to get better. So it's fair to say that I think I can do a little bit better than that. But I haven't really put a number to it yet. All right, and then biggest biggest training gap that you got to fill physiologically, like with your preparedness as an athlete. What do you think is the biggest gap right now for you to for you to fill? What we'll void? Honestly, I think it's I think it's having or being able to train pull vault every single week from now on until the Olympics and with no interruption with injuries and so forth and just having a full year of training where where nothing's really bothering me too much so that yeah I'm able to jump for a full year which I haven't been able to in a few years just because like injuries have stopped me from doing it so I think that will be key just being be, staying healthy and being able to train the entire year. Got it. All right. Well, thanks. Uh, thanks for being with us, Sandre. We're going to we're going to close out here. Um, so viewers or listeners, whatever you are, make sure you subscribe uh, to the to the podcast as well as the YouTube. We'll have a video up. Um, Isaiah will put the link for the YouTube video in the bio of this. Sandre, what's your uh, what's your at for Instagram? At Sandre, S-O-N-D-R-E underscore P-V. OK, that's easy. He didn't include his last name. Uh, so, so follow Sandre. Uh, watch him at the Olympics, probably 2021, maybe maybe this this coming summer. You guys will have some televised events, so uh, do that. And uh, make sure you guys go to THB Strength if you're looking for coaching for vertical jump, um, whether it's one foot, two foot, track and field. We do we do that for for jumpers as well. A lot of people, I guess, ask that question, and I'm like, uh, I'm formerly trained as a track coach. <laughs> uh, so if you're interested in that, you guys can sign up for individual uh, coaching there. Isaiah, do you have anything else to say? Uh, nah, this is, this is an interesting podcast. Learned a lot. I'm going to be looking at, uh, pole vault videos after this. <laughs> <laughs> and thanks, thanks right. a lot for having me, both of you. Yeah, for yeah. sure, man. I hope you, I hope you enjoyed it. Um, but all right, guys, we're, we're signing off. Peace. <laughs>